differences. You guys want to talk to first? Ready? Right. All right. Hey, welcome to all of my friends here that have come for my brother's birthday party that I've had planned for a year and a half when I met George and suggested we get together to talk about the Billy Meyer case. And Dave and I have been following uh, Wendell and, and Michael's uh, research on this case for 20 years when we got the original picture book and, and read Wendell's book and it changed our lives. And today is a, an opportunity to 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 immerse ourselves and find out the latest of what's here and, and, and share all kinds of wonderful stories about uh, this, this particular investigation and other related UFO phenomenon. And it's intended to be nothing but a big fun time for the five of us uh, with a recorded record for all of our enjoyment. If we decide that we want to do something with it later, we'll all share in that. So, you know, let's have the fun begin. We've got a wonderful plate of, uh, or a whole night of uh, wonderful uh, gourmet food that the Sterling Club has prepared for us, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming. So, you know, let's... Happy uh, birthday. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, happy birthday, David. Late, happy thank birthday. You. <laughs> thank you. Do you want us to sing now or <laughs> later? Okay, yeah. Hey, I'd like to at least introduce uh, the panel here. This, uh, we all know George Knapp, our local TV reporter. Wendell Stevens is the original primary investigator from the U.S. on this case. Uh, that began in, uh, did you begin in 75? So it began in 75, yes. Is that when you made, when did you make I your met first him in trip? in 1978. 78 was your first trip? Yes. And then Michael is the authorized U.S. spokesman for uh, Billy Meyer, and that's been, how long has that been going on? Actually, uh, I think we created our agreement about three years ago for the official authorized version. <clears throat> okay. And um, I'd like to start with a question. I mean, your first trip over there, did you go by yourself? <clears throat> yes, uh, I, I, I was collecting UFO photographs, and I was exchanging photographs with Lou Zinstag, who was the first UFO researcher, big UFO researcher in Europe. She published the first journal in German out of Basel, Switzerland, in Europe. And she was a niece of Carl Jung, who was also using her as a sounding board on some of these experiments. But the, the, the Swiss case happened in, almost in her backyard. She lived in Basel, and it was down near Zurich. So she went to meet Meyer as soon as she heard about it. And he welcomed her cordially and, and answered her questions and gave her a dozen of the pictures. And she, when she got back from that, she called me and she said, you got to see what I just saw. I'm coming to the States in another month to do some follow-up on the Adamski case with Tim Good and uh, and I would like to, I'll bring what I've got and show it to you. So uh, she said, "Will you be there next month?" And I said, "Yes." She says, "All right, I'll call you from the bus station in Tucson." She did. Went down and picked her up. Lee and Britt happened to be visiting me at that time in my home, and I went down and picked Lou and Tim Good up, brought them out, introduced them to Lee and Britt, and she produced uh, right after a round of introduction, produced these twelve pictures, and they were. They were mind-blowing. They, they just blow you away. They were the kind, anything that clear and sharp was always suspect. And they had to do a lot of investigating to get to the bottom of that. And I thought, man, this is really fantastic. If he's really getting the pictures, I've got to go meet him. So she said, I'll, uh, I said, how do I, how can I contact him? She said, you write me the letter and I'll translate and send it to him. He'll send it back in German and I'll translate it for you. After three exchanges, she says, this is too much for me. I'm going to get another one in. And she brought in Ilse von Jacobi, another journalist, German journalist, that read and wrote articles for European magazines in five languages, just like Lou Zinstag. And so she did the same thing for a time. And this is getting, I'm getting hot information that I need to go talk to the guy about. So I, uh, I had gotten my income tax refund back uh, in May and and I decided, ah, now I got the money, I'll go over there and see what I can find out. So I went out to Los Angeles and bought a Laker ticket. The Laker Airlines at that time didn't have a schedule. You bought a ticket, got in line, when they filled the airplane, off it went. <laughs> so I don't have a schedule of any kind. We went Laker every time. But <laughs> when I got to, to, to Zurich, I rented a car. I, I picked up Il Spon Jacobi in Wiesbaden ran a car and she said, Billy has moved and I don't know where he moved to. I said, well, how the hell are we going to find him? She said, well, we can go look. I said, look, go to Hinwell and look around and see where he went. She said, we could start there. 
And I had taken a, a lady friend that with me that I considered a reasonable psychic. And they're in the back of the car and I'm driving and, and uh, one of them says, I think if we turn here, you know, in Switzerland, the signs are just little signs about that wide and that long on a post. And, and in German, and I couldn't, didn't know, not familiar with the country or anything else. So we turned there. We came to another signboard with three or four signs on it, and they puzzled them in and said, go that way. We did, and another one, third move, and, and then uh, Ilse von Jacobi in the back says, uh, I think this is where we should be. This looks like the kind of a place it ought to be. So it was, it was, it was Schmidrudi, which means behind Schmidrudi. It's just a crossroads. And all there was was a dairy with a little restaurant in the front on the street side of the home and some rooms in the back, about five rooms that they rented out to tourists, and down a dirt road, and we we're trying to, Billy obviously doesn't live here, so Il says, well, let's go down the dirt road. We went down there about a thousand yards and came to a barn that some people were working on, and, and, and uh, she said, uh, I'll go knock on the door and see if they know anything about it. She rapped on the door and somebody opened the door and she recognized Billy's wife. And she said, uh, we're here to see Billy, is it okay? And, or whatever, they, in German, I didn't understand it. Anyway, she had told me when I was making arrangements to pick her up that I would have to have a translator because Billy didn't speak any English. So the, Billy's wife poured us all coffee, I said, set us down at, the, at their kitchen table, their breakfast table, which is nothing but a big oak door with legs on the corners. And we're sitting down there and his wife served coffee to all of us and I turned to Ilse von Jacobi and uh, says, you know, indicating that she should translate. And then I looked at Billy sitting right across from me. He's sitting there with his hands folded on the table in front of him like that, quiet. And I looked at him and I said, Billy, I pleased to meet you. I, I have some, in, some questions I would like to ask. Do you mind? He says, no, Mr. Stevens, I do not mind. If you speak slowly, I can understand. And I looked at my translator, her mouth is open, and she's looking at me with big eyes, and she said, well, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> I said, he just did. And I turned to him and says, how long have you been speaking English? He said, oh, I can speak a little bit. He says, if you speak slowly, I can understand. He, then he added, he said, if you were an Arab and sat down there across from me, I could answer just as well. So then I thought, how does he do this? And I talked, saw him one, later at one time, I saw him talking to a Japanese visitor in Japanese. So somehow he has a way of getting what he needs to communicate with some. You said this guy was a, 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 a magazine reporter. Was there any coverage? Was there news coverage of, of what was, Billy was seeing in his photographs in Europe? There was one article written by Ilse von Jacobi, who was introduced to him by Lou Zinstag after the communication started with me. And Ilse von Jacobi wrote a two-page article for uh, a magazine, an Italian magazine called Il Misterio. And it was just, a t just two pages facing each other on a, a summary uh, and two pictures and a picture of Billy. And uh, that was the first exposure he got. Then Blick and uh, some of the other news magazines began attacking the case right away, which was interesting because uh, why didn't they go down and investigate it instead? They didn't even go to the property. They wrote their attacks from someplace else. And I found that interesting because, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do something, you gotta go there and, and look them in the eye and, and talk just what I was doing. So here's Billy sitting across from me. And I, 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 my first is impression is here's a, a guileless man he is not worried about the questions I'm going to ask him. He looks looking me straight in the eye. He doesn't look away. His gaze doesn't waver. He's not interested in anything else. He's patiently waiting for me to ask the question. And I said, started off with a pointed question. I said, uh, Billy, are these pictures of models? He says, oh, of course not, Mr. Stevens. I can't make a model. He only had one arm. And uh, Il Spongiacobi, or, or Lou Zinsack, had told me that he had a broken camera. It was a Japanese Ryko camera that had been dropped and the focus ring was jammed that couldn't turn it. And the mirror in the, beside the lens viewing window had fallen down and he couldn't look through the camera at all. So he just shot from the hip, so to speak, like that. And he was getting these beautiful pictures and 
he couldn't change the, the speed setting and he couldn't change, he shot everything at ASA 100 Kodak film if he could get it or any other ASA 100 and 1 35th of a second on F111. All the pictures were shot on F11. The same, the focus ring was jammed just a, about a 16th to a 32nd inch short of the infinity setting. So it, it meant that it, everything in focus had to be beyond 35 feet, which was the mm -hmm. Did focus. he give you pictures on that first visit? Did he give you something he gave to take me, home? He gave me, gave me 100 pictures. On that first visit? He let me, yeah, he let me in his little office and he let me go through his his stash of pictures there, all it had, they had done up there, and he'd taken, by that time he'd taken probably uh, six or seven series of pictures, and some of them, the series was more than one roll. So I went through and picked out the, the best <coughs> pictures of the lot, and I was gonna buy them from him, and he wouldn't take any money, he just gave them to me. So I took them home and I started studying them, and they were, I couldn't find any, I'd seen a lot of pictures and a lot of fakes, and I couldn't, figure out how he could be doing this with a broken camera and working alone and with one arm, you know. And uh, I became pretty much convinced that this is gonna take some real serious study because the pictures are too good for one thing. And, and when, I, when I asked him <coughs> why he was being allowed to get such good pictures, he said, they pose the ship. And I said, pose the ship? Why would they do that? He said, they have their reasons. And then he told me about the first contact event when he was, he had been to a, a metaphysical meeting in somebody's house in Hinwell, an attorney's house, where they were discussing the voices recorded in a silent room by Rudive and Constantine, they wrote a book on it. And they had discussed that and he came home and he had a cast off tape recorder too, a broken tape recorder that he had fixed and was, and he set it up in the house in a silent room and tried to see if he could get a voice. And his first two or three attempts, nothing on the tape. He did tried once more and he urged everybody to be quiet and then they ran the tape and when they played that one back, there was a voice on it, a soft voice that said, Billy, take your camera and go outside. So he thought, well, he grabbed his camera and went outside and he's wondering what he's gonna do. His moped is standing there he threw his leg over it and pushed it, started it, and was just driving, following his nose. And he went down their road, down to the road by the little dairy where we turned in, and down the road, a winding mountain road to the town below, and through Hinwill and out to a forest preserve. And he, he still doesn't know where he's going. He's just, just idly making turns. And he gets in the forest preserve, he stopped his bike, moped and got off from it and is looking around when he heard the uh, humming whining noise. And then looking around for the noise, he saw a silvery disc come out of a cloud and then it went back in the cloud again. And the noise abated quite a bit. Then it came out once more and started a slow circle around him, came down and landed right in front of him. And he started running towards it to, to get closer and he the closer he got the more he was running against the force like he said it was like wading upstream on a river with us with a strong current and he said the closer he got the stronger the current was till he reached a point where he couldn't make any progress and he sat down on the ground like that trying to figure out what he's gonna and then a figure came out from behind the ship and walked towards him and sat down on the grass with him and started a conversation she said now listen very carefully because I have some very important information and I don't want you to, to forget any of it. He said, how will I remember this? I don't have a notebook or a pencil or a recorder. She says, I'll help you. And she told him about the destruction of our ionosphere at that time. And she said, according to their measurements, we had already lost 6% of our ionosphere and it was on an ever increasing scale of, of degradation. And she said that she, she wanted him to, uh, represent the, pr the problem to the Swiss government. She said, they'll, they'll take your pictures, they'll, they'll, first they'll study them to see how, if they're real or not, and they'll try to prove how they were faked. And then when they find out that they can't prove it, then they're gonna ask you who are they and where did they fr come from? So that did happen. And, and, and uh, so the Swiss government studied the pictures and they couldn't successfully disprove them. But anyway, she did says- Did they issue a report? 
Did the Swiss government issue any kind of report like, hey, we studied I, them, we don't know what the heck I to make them? I don't know. I don't. That'd be pretty If they did, they kept it very secret. They, in fact, they wouldn't even talk to us about their study. But the idea was uh, Switzerland was a neutral country sitting between two Cold War powers that were primarily responsible for the degradation of the ionosphere. Industrial gases are what's doing it. Heavier gases that rise slowly, pick up one ion and descending. It takes 10 years for them to rise to the ionospheric level. She's explaining all of this to Billy, who she's not a scientist. He has a sixth grade education. And she's explaining that, that the deterioration is on an ever increasing scale and they project for the next 10 years where the gases will continue. If we stopped everything at that moment, the gas would rise for another 10 years. She said the de de degradation will approach 10%. And she said, that's serious. So he, she asked him to contact his government and ask them to intercede between the two Cold War powers and try to s slow down the, 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 the contamination of the ionosphere. And nobody wanted to listen to him. And after a few weeks, he came back and she said, what did they say? He said, they, nobody will talk to me. She said, all right, you write, a, 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 write up a letter, what I told you. And she and she'd already, when he got back from that meeting, he sat down to make notes in, in longhand and his hand took off writing rapidly, straight away from like that in, a, in, a, in his hand, but very rapidly, faster than he could normally write. And everything came out word for word in the dialogue which amazed Billy at that time. He thought, gee whiz, they have a fantastic memory. Then she, later she explained to him that they, the, the meeting was recorded by a, a machine, a device, that they tuned to Billy's brain and it transmitted it back. So it was all done by a machine automatically and, and they didn't miss a word. So she comes back and, and she said, uh, she, she asked him to send the, the communications, which he did, and uh, they, nobody responded, and she asked him to send, do it again and send them to all the consulates and embassies in Switzerland. There were 51, I think. And they made up a whole bunch of letters and, and, and had them hand-delivered, and nobody re only one country responded, and that was East Germany. So the, nobody is asking him uh, who's, who's, what do they want or anything like that. So he, she says, uh, what kind of response do you get? He says, absolutely none. He says, why don't you do it yourself? And she said, we have tried. She said, we contacted one of the presidents. You know, Switzerland has five elected presidents and they rule as a presidential council and the chairmanship rotates every three months. She said, we contacted one of the presidents. He was so upset about it, he didn't tell his family, he didn't tell his wife, didn't tell his kids, didn't tell his colleagues. And he's terrified, he was, he's not going to do anything. So she said, we were hoping that you, you could get their attention. Somebody has to do this. And he said, he, and, and, and then they sent him to all the councils and, and, and the embassies. Did they ask, no. did he ask why me? At any yeah, point? She, she, she did. He said, why me? And she said, that's why, because they, they will analyze the pictures and want to know, if, since they can't successfully dispute them, they will want to know who they are and what they want. And, he said, and she said, then you tell them. And tell, be sure and, and, and tell them about the degradation of the, of the ionosphere. But so, I mean, why he was chosen, you know? Sixth grade yes, education, yes. one-armed guy. He was chosen because she explained to him at the time, which he didn't really accept either. She said, you have been a prophet in the past. You have historical references in, in your Old Testament of your biblical works. You experienced incarnations as prophets over time. And she said, you are the modern day prophet. And we want you to be, be sure and get this information out because it's a serious matter. And then she explained that you think that your earth is your earth, but it's our earth too. We have been here as long as you have. And we have colonized this planet several times over after cataclysmic destructions where the humanity loses all of its technology and all of its communications, everything breaks down. They're reduced to savage hand-to-mouth li hand living. The play herons have come back with a delegation again and recolonized the planet. And the last time she said this was done was 60,000 years ago under a leader, a Plehara leader called Erhus, A-A-H-R-U-S. And she said that he came with uh, 200 sub-gods and uh, 
They set up little fiefdoms all over the, the world and tried to raise Earth, primitive Earth humanity a notch back towards civilization again. And she explained that he was one of those sub-gods and they had strict rules about mixing with Earth women, but he took women into his household and bound himself in Earth evolution as a result of it. So the other prophets all came down from that time. All the old biblical prophets are within that 60,000 year period. There's other lifetimes before that where he enjoyed similar relations, but he is there. He's a spirit akin to theirs, of their spirit nature. Oh, and, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. When did Lee finally start going over there with you, Lee Elders? Uh, about the third time I went over there, Lee and Tom were doing, were sweeping a bank system in, in London. They, they were doing uh, debugging of computers and telephone systems. And they were doing a bank in London and I, that third time I got persuaded Billy to take me around to all of the photo sites so we could see what was there. And he agreed to do that. And after the two or three sites, I read, immediately I knew that there's no way he could fake those. There's no way to suspend a line because the hill slopes down at a steep angle and it's 10 miles across the valley to the other side. There's usually no trees in the, in, in the immediate vicinity to string any wires to, and he only had one arm to climb the tree and string the wires. And I, I called Lee and Tom over in England, and I said, you gotta come over and see what I'm seeing. And they took, bought an airline ticket and came over, and the next day we went around to all the sites, and we took Billy, or he took, he took us, but he took the same camera he used to take the pictures, and he reenacted each photo event step by step of where he took each of the pictures and how he moved and where he aimed the camera and things like that so we could fit the pictures back into a, a, a pattern. And, and that was very useful because it, it was further confirmation that there's no way that he could have faked the pictures. They actually had to be posed. And uh, that's where they became convinced that the, this case is really happening because there's no way they could have, he could have got those pictures with a broken camera and without assistance or help of any kind in that yeah, way. Yeah, this, this was done before computers were around that you could fake the stuff with. Yeah, but we didn't have that kind of computer right. then. Yeah. Did, um, on that first trip with Lee, did the CIA stop you guys on that trip? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, no, it wasn't that trip. That, they were already there. But after we came back and we had, I had got more pictures, by now I had 135 of them, and we looked at the pictures and, and we're still trying to figure out, we got a lot of questions unanswered and we decide we're gonna to have to go back again. And we made that decision in a telephone call between me and Lee living in Phoenix. And we agreed to meet halfway at Picacho Peak. So uh, we, I drove up from Tucson, he drove down from Phoenix, we met there and we decided we we're gonna to have to go back again and do some more field work and probably rent uh, laser uh, surveying instruments and major distances and a whole lot of things is, so we could further analyze the pictures. And we broke up from that and left and, and, and then things, Lee had a gap in his business and I had gotten some more money for something else and, then, and I called him again, he, or he called me and he said, uh, let's, let's meet. We, always, we knew where we were gonna meet, but we didn't mention at that time and we met again and, and set a date that we were gonna to try to go, and again, we we're gonna go by Laker. So after that meeting, and uh, just, just less than two weeks after that, Lee got a letter from uh, England, and blue parchment, beautiful blue parchment with silver lettering on the return address corner of the envelope. The page inside was matching blue parchment with the letterhead and silver on the top, and it was uh, only a two paragraph short letter that said, uh, greetings, I understand you're coming to Europe soon. Uh, we, I believe we have interest in common. Call me at this number, and he gave me a telephone number before you leave. So Lee brought that to the next meeting and, and it was signed, Mark Nathan, Secretary General of the Knights Templars of Malta. Well, that, I didn't know who the Knights Templars were or anything else, but it looked like expensive stationery and a, a nice signature, Mark Nathan and all that. We looked at it, we decided we don't need any help. Screw him, we're not gonna call the number. So 10 days later, we got another letter, said you did not respond to 
our last communication, please call me at this number and the same number again. When you get to London, this time the, the letter was on white parchment with gold stamping on the envelope and gold letterhead on the paper. And it was signed, uh, Mark Nathan, secretary, whatever it is, of the House of Commons. And it was on House of Commons stationery. So we thought, gee whiz, this guy gets around, whoever he is, <laughs> but we're not going to call him because we don't need any interference. So we, we bought our tickets at Laker and waited for it to go, and we, we left on an unscheduled departure and arrived at Heathrow Airport at an unscheduled time. And uh, we got off the airplane, took our bags, and walked to the subway station to catch it down to Victoria Station, downtown London. The train left every five minutes because we, we could have been on any train. When we got in, the Victoria Station went up the stairs to the starter platform at the railroad station there, and we see the line of black taxis out the door on the side. We know it, we're supposed to take the front taxi, and we're standing there trying to f decide whether we'll have a sandwich or something before we get in the taxi or go on the taxi and do it later. When a big black guy, big guy, came up and tapped him on the front, you're Mr. Elders? He said, yes. He said, I've got your taxi come with me. We said, what about the taxis out there? He said, I've got your taxi, come with me. And he <laughs> takes us around the end of taxis and around the corner out of sight of the other cabbies in the line there, put us in the same kind of a London taxi, big black li limousine taxi, locked us in, and then we drove around town. I said, I started to tell him we were uh, staying, gonna stay with a, a, a gunnery sergeant down in Kensington. He says, I know where you're going. And he drove around and got us completely lost and he pulled up in front of a a hotel on the, su the south side of, of Hyde Park. It's the Grosvenor House Hotel. He said, this is an interesting place. Movie stars live here. And he parked the taxi on the only striped spot for a taxi in front of that whole hotel and got out, had took us out, then locked the cab and left it there and took us inside. And he took us up, uh, up the elevator to the fifth floor and down a corridor on the left of about four doors or five doors, made a secret knock on the door, tick, 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 tick. The door opened and a round face with round glasses looked out and they said something and the door went all the way open. He motioned for us to go in. It was a kind of, it was a very small kitchenette arrangement with just a refrigerator and a hot plate and a sink. And the door on the other end and the same man went and opened that, said something to somebody inside, motioned for us to go in. And it was a, it was a big living room with, with a four seat, a four cushion sofa on one side, facing a huge full wall picture window like that. And there was a love seat over here on this side, a coffee table in front of that, a coffee table in front of mine. And he was sitting over in the corner, standing in front of a, a big fat black overstuffed chair, leather chair, with a table on each side of the arms. And he said, I'm Mark Nathan. And, and we said, oh, nice to meet you. He said, he said uh, Thanks for well, he said, I, I, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Do you mind? And we all started sitting down. And just as he sat down, the white telephone on one side rang. Ring, 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 ring. And I looked at Lee, and he looked at me. We'd heard that, heard that ring in Billy's house. And Lee had already explained to me that no telephone can ring 10 rings because there's only six cams on the lobe, or six lobes on the cam. So you can only get six longs or shorts in any combination, no 10 rings. And that was a signal to Billy when he didn't recognize whether he was thinking something up or whether they was being transmitted, the phone would ring 10 times and he would know it was them transmitting until he got accustomed to recognizing the, the, the reception, you know, physically. So anyway, we look at each other and he's on, he, Mark Nathan is over there by his chair saying, hello, hello, hello. Hello? And he put, says, I wonder who could call this line. And he says, says, I'll call the operator. So he called the operator and he says, did you ring? She said, no. He said, could anybody call in this room without going through your switchboard? She says, not in this hotel. He said, well, my phone rang. How do you account for that? She didn't, didn't know how. And he's puzzling over that when he puts the phone back down and he starts to talk again. The red phone on the other side rang. 10 short rings, ring, 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 like, and Lee and I looked at each other again, and he's, same thing, nobody on the line, and he says, this is a discrete line, it's like, it's a, this, this line is supervised all the time, 
it's a hotline. He said, there's an operator on it all the time. And he punched the button and says, did you call? She said, no. He said, could anybody call this room from anywhere else? She says, of course not. And he put that down and he's shaking his head. And Lee said, you know, did you notice that was a strange ring? He says, it was a strange ring. Lee says, that was 10 shorts. He said, that's the plate of signal to Billy Meyer that to confirm what he's thinking is a telepathic transmission. And then he got real excited about it. So uh, he asked us if we would look for certain things in the household, said they tried to penetrate it for two years, couldn't get anybody inside because they were all close friends and, uh, and, and, and they weren't able to put anybody in there. You're, talk, you're talking about Mark Nathan. Mark yeah, Nathan's yeah, asking were, us to do that. Yeah, he's really introduced through. to us as a case officer for London. Lee told me later the case officer turn means that he's the senior CIA officer in the London district and that he controls all the CIA operations. And we're in, a, in this, the big dog's office right there on Grosvenor Park. And the American Embassy is on one side, and the Russian Embassy is on the other. And he's asking us to look into the case when we get to Switzerland. He knows where we're going and what we're going to do. And uh, we never got in or out of Switzerland ever without being picked up by this same big black cabbie. Always knew where we were, where we get off the boat train, cabbies there. Wherever we arrived in London, the cabbies there waiting. And he would take us right to Mark Nathan. We had no choice. We couldn't go anyplace else. And, and, and uh, Mark would, Mark would, uh, he wouldn't take your evidence. He would, he would photograph or they would borrow it. What would they do with the evidence that you had? Which? No, Mark well, Nathan. When I, when I, when we'd come back, he picked us up right with our baggage and everything else and take us right to Mark Nathan's office. And Mark would say, did you get anything this time? I'd say, oh, yes, yeah, some more pictures. He'd say, can I see him? And I'd hand him to him, and he'd give them to somebody else, and they'd go out of the room. And then they'd come back in, and he'd hand them back to me. I had contact notes, same thing. I, when I had, came back with uh, 1,800 pages of contact notes, he wanted to see him. I handed it to him. They went out of the room and came back, and he handed them back to me. I'm sure they made copies then. And uh, this was a time when we had, uh, we, we had taken a young Mormon student from Brigham Young University with us, lived in Phoenix, and he wanted to go, and he wa offered to pay his own way just to go meet Billy. So we took him along, and uh, he was a kind of a clumsy guy. He was always falling over his own feet and drawing attention to us. He he'd fall, stumble going up or down the stairs. And the second day we were in our guest house, he's missing, and there's a commotion out in the street, and we look out, and there's a, a tour bus with a bunch of Russian tourists or visitors getting off the tour bus. He's out there talking to him in Russian. And when he came back in, we said, where the hell did you learn Russian? He said, I majored in it at Brigham University. He said, I was just practicing. I said, well, what do you think this is? The locals are thinking about our team out there talking to the Russians. <laughs> he said, well, he said, I didn't mean any harm. So uh, we, uh, next time we, we, Lee and I decided we can't keep him much longer, so we took a roll of film, pulled it out a little ways, pushed it back in, and said, we got this fresh roll of film to Billy. We're going to have to courier it back to Phoenix and get it developed there, and he's going to have to go tonight. Tom's waiting for it. So uh, we put, drove him to the airport, and we stopped on the way back in Winterthur and to an all-night telegraph office there and sent a telegram to Tom tell him to meet Russ that he, Russ uh, is on his way. And then when we got back to the guest house, I missed the pictures I'd gotten from Billy and I had, I had put them in my shaving kit, but I thought I put them in the side of my bag. And when they weren't in the side of my bag, I told Lee, I said, oh God, Russ took our pictures. I'm sure because I can't find them. And he said, oh, we, we, can't, we gotta get them before he does anything with them. So we went to the telegraph office and sent this telegram. It was, 1.30 in the morning, and the, the telegraph office only had one person, and a little old lady, very feeble, and she took our message and she sent it out. And that next time we were picked up by the cabbie in London and taken to Mark Nathan's office, he says, just what the hell is going on here? We said, what are you talking about? He said, well, how did the Russians get the pictures? We said, Russians? What do you mean Russians? He threw the telegraph at us. On his desk was the same telegram that, or copy of the one we had sent from Winterthur in Switzerland. He says, how did they get them? 
We said they didn't get them, and they, then they calmed down a little bit. But uh, things like that went on all the time. <laughs> Can I get a, just a little? Yeah, let's tell you what. Let's get some. Uh, and, you know, that's why that's why I was waiting for a break so we could do that. Good. Absolutely. In fact, uh, we'll get a, another round of drinks. And, you're, uh, you're still in contact with Mark Nathan? Yeah, Mark Nathan calls us every Christmas. He lives over in Florida. He's retired. He's, he, he was a member of the House Correct. of Commons? No, he, not, he wasn't, okay. he, nor was he a that member of the cover. Knights Templars of Malta. Okay. He, uh, those, are, those were uh, covers oh. that he used to contact us. But I, I'll have to tell you what, in a minute here then about how familiar we he started we started calling each other by our first names and about the sixth time we came out we were picked up and taken to his office again and after he talked to us for a, a little while he said look he said uh, could you come to my house for dinner tonight my wife is fixing a nice dinner for you folks so <coughs> we said yeah we could so he said I'll send the car by to pick you up by now he knew where we, we stayed with the gunner down in Kensington he sent a his dusty green limousine, big long stretch limousine to pick us up and all the neighbors are gawking out the windows when the limousine drove up to look for us. And uh, so he drove us to his, they, the limousine drove us right to his house and his wife turned out to be an ethnic Chinese woman. She was a high ranking agent in the Chinese communist government and they're married, living together. <laughs> and they had household service but she served the dinner. And after dinner, they, he invited us to go into their parlor and he offered Lee and I cigars and the women wine. And then I'm sitting on a three cushion sofa there and he came over to a big lamp at the end of the sofa and picked the lamp up and set it over against the wall on the floor. And then he picked up the eight sided wooden table and picked it up and it was hollow and set that over on the floor by the lamp. And inside was a big safe, an iron safe in the cement block in the floor. And he bent down and spun it down. He said, I want to remember the letter. He said, I want to show you something. And he opened the safe and he took out uh, a, uh, a, some papers, laid them on the floor. And then he took out a package of passports, laid them on the floor. And he was getting something else. So Lee says, are those passports? All passports? He said, yes. And he picked them up and tossed them over to Lee. And Lee took the rubber band off and he says, man, you got passports for every place, India, China, or India, Canada, England, Australia, do you use all of these? He said, in my business, you need a lot of identification. And he put the rubber band around him, back, put them back, and he took out a, um, a report. It was about an inch thick, and it had a blue cover with a red stripe, plastic stripe, from the upper right-hand corner to the lower left, and it had said in big letters under the stripe, eyes only. Sop, secret, and a code name, and eyes only. And he laid that on the floor, and uh, he got something else out, and he tossed a little sack of uh, miniaturized uh, transceivers over to Lee to look at, and uh, some other things in the sack. And then Lee looked at him, and he tossed it back, and he started putting things back in the, in the same order in the safe and put the the blue secret book in there, the booklet, and he put the passports back in on top of that, and then he closed the door, spun the dial, put the octagon table back on, and then the lamp. Well, we, at that point, we said, we're getting a little tired, could you take us back to our, our walk-up? So he sent us back in our limousine, the walk-up, had big oak doors on the front that were closed with a heavy oak bar and to, to let you into the ground floor. And the guy had a Doberman inside that guarded the inside that, like when they closed at night. And they locked, there was a gate halfway up the stairs from the third level to the fifth level. And they, we went upstairs and, and the, the guy had to come and unbar the door and hold the dog while we get, went up the stairs. And then he locked the gate behind us. And I, t I told Lee, I said, we ought to get up early and go down to breakfast before the table's all dirty. He said, okay, that night when we were going back, he agreed, and then the next morning when I'm up early and I took my shower, I'd get up early anyway. And uh, I went, knocked on his door and, and Lee opened it, hair all over his head and uh, sleepy eyes. And uh, 
He said, oh, you didn't mean that, did you? I said, yes, I did, let's go. He opened the door further and, and he went, splashed water in his face, put his shirt on, started to pull his pants on, buckled it, and then he reached over. The night before when I was getting, when, making arrangements to go there the next morning, I, he started undressing and he put his, took his change out of his pocket and he put his wallet on a, a metal shift robe that you hang clothes in and he put his wallet on there and then he put the keys up there and then he put some change up there all clanging when he put them down you know and then he started to go to bed so I said I'll see you in the morning and then I'm the next morning I'm back and he's reversing the process he washed his splash water in his face and he pulled his shirt on pulled his pants on he reached up to get his wallet to put in his back pocket and he did a double take and he says hey what's this and I said it looks like that book in Mark's safe he said, it sure does, doesn't it? He says, it's under the money, the keys, and the wallet. How the hell did they do this? <laughs> I said, who do you think did it? He said, I haven't any idea. And so we woke Britt up. She said, well, you better tell Mark. So Leah and I trooped down to the lock gate at halfway up, and there's a telephone there. And we called Mark, woke him up, and said, uh, we think we've got your blue book in the room here. Uh, he says, ah, oh, stop pulling my leg. I don't have time for crap like that this time of morning. Lee says, well, I tell you what, you better go down and look in your safe and see if the book is there. And he says, all right. And he laid the phone down, and in a few minutes he came back completely breathless, hyperventilating. And he says, Jesus Christ, how did you do that? And he, he says, have you opened it? And Lee says, no, we're not interested in that. He says, well, don't touch it. I'll be right over. And he was there in 10 minutes. He'd come rushing up the door and rushing up the stairs, and he looked at the book, slapped his head, and he says, Jesus, how did you do that? We said, we didn't do it. We didn't touch your damn book. We didn't. We said, it's out of your safe, isn't it? He said, it's gone, and there it is. So he picked it up, and he put it under his arm, and he said, you, you sure you didn't look at it? We said, no, we're not interested in that sort of thing. But we believe that the Palladians apported that out of his safe for some reason, for some demonstration to him. But he, he got the, the drift of the thing after a while and began to try to use the Palladians uh, to get the information that he wanted, which they cooperated with to some degree. You know, they, they never frustrated our interference. Some, one time a truck tried to run us off the road, and another vehicle came from behind our rented van around us, but pulled up to the truck that was trying to force us off the road, got on his rear bumper and pushed the truck forward so that we were clear, and then the truck speeded up and left, and the other car speeded up and left too. And he said, uh, next time we saw him, he said, those people were serious, weren't they? We said, what, what do you mean, serious? He said, they, they were gonna push you off the road. I said, who the hell are they? He said, we don't know who they are. He said, we think they're East German intelligence. <laughs> and then one time, we came through and he had, in the Bond pictures, you remember the guy that has the monocle yeah. in one eye? Yep. He had him sitting by his desk there when he came in. When they're, they, the guy from the, from the James Bond James pictures, yeah. Donald, Donald Pleasance. Huh? Donald Pleasance. Yeah, he, was in, we, he introduced this to him. He says, this guy plays in the Bond pictures. He said, he's an a, uh, East German agent. He says, we work together. And uh, then yeah. another time when we, they were taken to the, we were taken to the Grosvenor House Hotel, there was big power vans drawn up behind the hotel. They were shooting a Bond picture, and this guy was in the picture. And this was the particular time when uh, uh, our chief of intelligence was having a meeting in the same Grosvenor House Hotel with some British officers. And, and this Bond movie is being shot. They shot the same scene five or six times in one day, and the next day they're shooting the same scene again. So we wondered if they needed that many takes on that scene, or why are they there, and why the big power trailers, and what's, what do they need all that power for, and all that sort of thing. It was a really a mysterious setup. And Mark Nathan said that we have our own way of doing things. <laughs> I think I would have been awfully tempted to look in that book. <laughs> yeah, too. I well, we didn't because we, we, by that time, we trusted him and he trusted us. He hadn't harmed us. He hadn't deprived us of any liberty. He hadn't forced us to do anything. We were cooperating with him to, as much as we wanted to. And as long as it was in this state, we could decide when we didn't want to cooperate with uh -huh. him. And, and he wouldn't know it. 
So we just kind of left it like that. Yeah, he told us later, years later, he told us that it had something to do with uh, worm culture in Africa. <laughs> worm culture? Worm culture, yeah. Did uh, Billy show you the contact notes on your first visit too? Yeah. He showed me his, his original ones were written up in longhand in German, which I couldn't read. Then uh, after he had taken probably six or seven contact notes, somebody found an old... Well, it's an old <laughs> IBM selector typewriter. I, no, Wasn't no, that, the first one was, uh, was a... Uh, I think it was a Remington, an early Remington with uh, the manual typewriter mm -hmm. with the, the keys, and they had to straighten the keys and everything. And he was typing that, well, on that one like that, mm -hmm. one key at a time. George Potsdam? And then. What is it? Potsdam's? Yeah, Adonis. Semyasi said they, they would like to borrow the typewriter to take a look at it. So Ketzel came and picked the typewriter up, and Billy delivered the typewriter with a ream of paper. And then a week later, Ketzel brought it back, and he says, a very primitive machine. <laughs> but the next time Billy was started to type cards in the office, he started getting the contact note on the Remington typewriter at a real fast rate of speed, like that, much faster than he could do it when he was hunting for the keys. And, and, and that's the one that I, I, I heard him typing on when, when he was trying. And I looked in there, and he was in a kind of a altered state of consciousness. He was, he was looking straight forward like that and typing about that fast, you know? And I turned on my tape recorder and recorded a few minutes of it. It was tick, 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 tick. On, the, on that typewriter, you had to roll a patent and had to shift, move the carriage and change the, the case and everything else, all with one Like one he was paper. taking telepathic dictation or something. Yeah, yeah, they, they told him that it was done by a machine aboard the spacecraft that they could program the machine to transmit. And so now they had reprogrammed the machine to transmit with the, the Remington typewriter. Then later, a, a, a woman gave him a, another typewriter, a, a IBM Selectric, Selectronic, or whatever it was. And then he could do them faster even on the IBM Selectric because he did a lot of things that they rolled the patent and he you know, only had to get one key to change the case. So then he got a lot of the contact notes on that, and I had some of each. Time. Wendell, you should grab a bite here. These guys are hungry. Yeah, yeah please dig in. <laughs> We're enjoying your conversation, but <clears throat> let's not let this food go to waste while okay. it's hot. Filet mignon? Really good, sir. Huh? No. Michael, when did, when did you first read the contact notes? The filets later. Oh. This, this is a scout, Baker Mike Scout. Oh, can you reach a knife and a fork? Oh, sure. Uh, would you like some, would you like a pot stick or two? Or some dumplings? Oh, that's, that's, that's too big. <laughs> Could yeah. you get some big ones here? Huh? I think so. <laughs> Boy, huh? <laughs> how do you, how do you get those big ones that size, for crying yeah. out loud? Yeah. When I have a party, alien. it's big shrimp. <laughs> these are alien shrimp, is what these are. <laughs> they tell boats They're fantastic. Things. Oh. I wish I could work the camera in my, in my cell phone. I'd take a picture of that for Susie. <laughs> <laughs> so how many trips did you guys make over there, Wendell? I think I made... Uh, I made uh, 14, Lee made 11, Tom made 3. When was the last time? Oh, it's about four years ago now. What's his health like? Actually, he's uh, doing pretty well. He, w he was kind of ill the last sick. time I was there, but he's doing better now, you know, Michael says. I just saw him in September. And in May before that, and I'll be over there in a few weeks. But he, he seemed to like he pulled himself together again. You know, Billy's very interesting. You see him when he's down. He, a couple trips ago, he had a bad back. He couldn't move. Mm -hmm. Next time I came back, there was nothing wrong. One of the strange things was that I was talking. At, I had been there, I think this was a year ago. And I got, was talking with a fellow, a Swedish guy I know, who's stayed longer at the uh, center. And he said Billy had had a bad fall. And he only has one arm. And he had to try to catch himself with his hand. And he tore somehow. The, the little finger got separated away. And there was very, a lot of damage. They had to take him to the doctor and x-rays. And they said there wasn't much they could do. He's just going to have to live with it or something. Mm -hmm. I talked to my friend, I don't know, six weeks later. and. He said, you know, a really funny thing happened. I said, what's that? He said, Billy came into the kitchen, 
to get coffee, and I noticed that he walked over, he picked up the coffee pot, he poured himself some coffee, sitting there drinking it. I said to him, what happened to your hand? He says, oh, Quetzal came and he fixed it. And indeed, done that a number of times. Yeah, they fixed him up a few times. He, he'll only let him do certain things so that he can be functional. They, like he won't, you know, accept a new arm or any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I remember, um, was it Asket that offered him a new arm or offered him a new arm? Asket, yeah. A mechanical or a human? Huge. She, like, said, she said, we can make you a bionic arm that would be as handy as the original one you had. He said, oh, I couldn't accept that. Now he that said, would, why not? That would have been some great He said, I wouldn't have it very long. That's he said, right. my government would take the arm away, yeah. study it, and make a new weapon, and that uh, would be just as bad off, and they would be better off. Shades of Terminator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he refused it. Turned it down. He had broken ribs one time. I think you even had that in the contact notes. Yeah, he was being pursued and he cut across through the woods on his moped and went through a ditch. Crashed with his moped and broke some ribs. So I actually picked him up and mended the ribs right then and there aboard the ship, just like that. They weren't even sore when he got home. Some of those, some of the stories in there are really pretty interesting about them letting him out in the middle of a snowy field and walking out or him putting his hand up into the cloak. Mm -hmm. He's, they let him out. The ship's eight feet high. And he reaches up and he sees his hand disappear as it gets close to the ship. He can see, you know, from here down. but And he can feel the ship and, of course, feel his hand, but can't see it. Pretty interesting. Yeah, the footprints that go out into the middle of the field and then they Stop. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were, um, you know, I, I noticed in the contact notes that you published that um, you you edited out some of the um, religious religious mm -hmm. of, of rather offensive language to the uh, well, Christian it religion. Well, offensive mostly. language, but it would have been offensive to Christians. Well, yeah, and I didn't think we should be. Criticizing. No, but clearly, they're part of their message is that um, you know, what our history is, what the truth about our history is, and uh, certainly that entails religion because that's part of our history. But you know, they're, I mean, they're trying to explain to us, you know, that they're basically our forefathers, right? Yeah. I mean, they. they they said we come from a common ancestry. Okay. Our forefathers were their forefathers. Okay. In the first contact notes, George, in the first visit, he is told by Semyasi of, she said, we know that you're aware of a secret old scripture and we want you to publish it because to us, she said, it seems the most important document in the world. What is it? Um, it's been published by, uh, it's been translated and published, but ostensibly in, I believe in the 60s, they led him to get in contact with a, um, a Coptic priest in Israel who also spoke Aramaic, and they led him, they led the two of them to a tomb that the, three, the two of them excavated for three days and found a scroll cased in resin under, under a rock in the back of the tomb of the sepulcher. Yeah, well, I know it's sepulchre. a different, it's a, I don't think it's there, it's a separate tomb if I recall, isn't it not? But, but anyway, wherever I it was. I understood that it was the tomb of the sepulcher. But, um, for Jesus, it would have the crucifixion. The original uh, tomb Ostensibly, of the it's the original gospel. And it tells, a bit of a different story, um, as you can imagine. A, Jesus was not born of a virgin. He was the son of somebody from the sky. And Gabriel. He Gabriel. Um, was certainly instructed by them at times in his life. He um, did not teach about the kingdom of God. He taught about spiritual things without using the phrase God. He survived the crucifixion. Um, he 
was obviously, and, Ju and Judas Iscariot was the writer of that gospel and his closest advisor and friend. And that the son of a Pharisee or a Sadducee named Judah Iheriot was, was actually his traitor. Um, that after he survived, that he and his mother and his brother and Judas, who were, had their, were in danger, um, actually they picked him up in the, I can't remember if it's one of the Gospels or the Book of Acts where it says that Jesus ascended to heaven in front of a bunch of people. Well, that scene's in there too, except it's, he themed up Scotty. Okay, he goes up in the ship, they take him up to Tyre or Sidon or whatever it was, meet his mother and his brother and, and Judas. <clears throat> they live there for a while and then they take a journey several years uh, to India where he and he's teaching along the way and of course he's been he meets with um, enmity and uh, uh, the rejection all along the way there was a small and he settles in India also a the be. Buddhist there ah, it's, it's, he becomes known as a great small. teacher there he lives a life he gets married has four children <laughs> dies at 108 110 years old and his one of his sons brings the original scroll back to the church at Jerusalem at that time. And, uh, and Judas' deathbed, he commissioned his oldest son to return the rewrite of the document of, of the scrolls to the tomb, which the son did. And that was oh. one that the Meyer and priest uh, Isa Rashid, Rashid, Isa Rashid were taken to to recover the what was left there. Many years ago, by the son, oldest son of Judas. I thought it was Jesus' oldest son. It's Judas' oldest son. Judas' oldest. Oh, okay. Son. I got that a little confused. Um, but then, so they have this scroll. So this guy has this scroll, and he he knows Aramaic. There's only about a hundred thousand people in the world that know Aramaic. And the scroll is, and Jesus spoke Aramaic. That's he didn't speak Hebrew or Greek. He spoke Aramaic, and so he's translating the document. And if you read the document, you would see that it is. It doesn't. It's not very kind to the Jews, um, and it it unwinds a whole lot of Christianity, or at least sheds a completely different light on it, and casts doubt on many, many of their most important articles of faith. And um, well, it's Jesus in this document is quite harsh on the Jews. And um, ostensibly, the Jewish government found out about the scrolls. I mean, because it had taken the guy a long time to translate it, and I'm sure word got out. And according to the story, uh, on the, the guise of um, stopping terrorism, or, or what have they, you? What, what happened was uh, the man, Issa Rashid, reported, sent to Meyer a portion of the translated scrolls, about a third of them from what I remember. Translated to German, yeah. To German, from Aramaic into German. And he wrote a letter to Meyer saying that he might not hear from him for a while because he and his family had to flee from Jerusalem because various parties had uh, found out that he had the scrolls. They fled into a refugee camp in Lebanon, and he took the scrolls and he hid them in the wall of the building there. Within a short period of time, the Israelis came in, and they destroyed that...